Hello, my name is Amber Cardinal. I'm Mandan Hiratsa of Rikara Nation on my grandmother's side and Kiwina Bay Ojibwe from my grandfather's side. I'm a project coordinator at the American Indian Cancer Foundation and I'm here today to introduce our student speakers. Before we move on to that, I know that we're nearing the end. We have about an hour and a half left. Our brains are full, our bellies are full. So if we could get everyone to stand up and stretch, shake it out, bust a move if it suits you, <laughs> wake our brains up a little bit. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> right. We feeling better, feel good, awake? Okay, so I'm gonna get started. Uh, with the American Indian Cancer Foundation, we've held many talking circles and facilitated strategic planning meetings with our Minnesota tribal and urban American Indian communities. And no matter where the conversations start, they always come back, come back to two emerging themes, food and our native youth. We know that knowledge for effective solutions to our disparate health outcomes is held within the community and they've been speaking to us. Crystal, Janie Hip, and the opening panel repeatedly emphasized the importance of our youth when setting the stage for the conference yesterday morning, and I couldn't agree more. You saw the powerful video before lunch from Fertile Ground 2, which reiterated the importance of our youth. Melanie, who was up here earlier with Stacy and I, um, had the pleasure of facilitating the youth work group at Fertile Ground 2, uh, which was similar to the work groups that we had this morning. We kept having people ask, what are the youth doing? What are the youth saying? And people literally would just pop into our uh, work group just to listen to what the youth were saying. They really wanted to know. So there was so much interest in the youth and what they were saying and doing that the Fertile Ground 2 Planning Committee decided to have an impromptu youth presentation. It was so refreshing because their thoughts weren't contained in that box that we get stuck in and they weren't constricted by the barriers and the challenges that we know exist in Indian country. They were so full of optimism and ingenuity. I truly believe everyone in that room learned from the student group. They were given hope and a newfound energy for creating the change that we want to see. In planning this conference, we wanted to ensure that we created that space for everyone to have the opportunity to learn from some outstanding Native student leaders. So let's take the time now to listen to what they have to teach us. Um, just to give you an idea of the format before we move on, each student will speak for 10 minutes and take questions right after they're speaking before the next student comes up. I'm gonna do quick intros uh, because I know we're behind time and I would rather hear, have you listen to them speaking. So please see the program for their extended bios. First, we have Rachel Cornelius of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin. She studied molecular and cellular biology and global health at Harvard. She's currently applying to medical school with the intention to serve people as a primary care physician in the future. Please welcome Rachel. All right, um, Shigo, Rachel Cornelius Ni Yugyats, Uguewe Ni Oneoteaga Ni. Hello, my name is Rachel Cornelius. I am a member of the Oneida Indian Nation of Wisconsin, People of the Standing Stone. I am very honored to have the opportunity to speak here today and to be able to represent my tribe. So for this presentation, we'll really be looking into the, into the importance of nutrition in our communities. Specifically, really how our long history, I think that that didn't pick up. If I turn my head away and you can't hear anything, let me know. Um, so we'll be looking into how our long history, how starvation and how what we eat today really affects our health currently. So why is all this important? Well, Native communities have a huge prevalence of diabetes and obesity, of metabolic diseases in their communities. And these diseases are linked to so many others, from cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and, ev and even depression and stress, anxiety. And so really understanding how to treat these is so important to treating and understanding our health now holistically. So, in order to first understand a problem though, and how to tackle it, we need to see, well, why? Why is this happening? Is it us? Is it the environment? Is it fry bread? <laughs> well, the answer might very well be all of it. And to see that, we need to go back and look at history, and that's a sad start. 
of long-term starvation on Indian reservations. I believe that the change in, the, in our diet from pre-colonization to post-colonization may very well be a contributing factor in many of the health disparities we face today. And so really to see how starvation can lead to such huge changes in our, metabol in our health, we'll, let's look at examples. So we see the Dutch famine, and here there was a number of cohort studies done where children were born to starved mothers, mothers who have, were depleted of nutrition. And these children were assessed for the risks of different diseases. And they actually showed increased risk of many diseases, including metabolic disorders. And even more so, they showed increased risk depending on the period of fetal development they had starvation. And dyslipidemia, which is associated with metabolic disorders, has actually been shown to have children have an increased risk of this when they're starved during the first trimester or early pregnancy. And if we look at an example of the Chinese famine, what this really shows is that if you have individuals who were starved during fetal development and they're then raised on a Western diet, then they have a huge prevalence of metabolic disorders. But what this also shows is the possibility that even if you are starved in your fetal, fetal environment and you're raised on a traditional diet, then that can almost seem to counteract it. If you look at the fetal exposed, it's almost similar to the non-exposed groups. So, it's not going, okay. Simultaneously, oh, actually, also what we see here is the importance of the severity of starvation or famine that you see. Because when there's less severe famine, there's really no significant difference between the individuals, the metabolic disorder, the prevalence of it, between less severely exposed and non-exposed. But you see a significant difference when looking at the severely exposed. So it's really saying the importance of severely exposed. Furthermore, what we see is that all across the board, whether you're severely exposed to starvation or less severely exposed to starvation, you will in general, as long as you are of an, of an overweight status, there, in those groups there will be a higher prevalence of metabolic disorders. And so that aspect is really seems to be independent of the level of starvation. And so this really hits in these three aspects that we do see in our communities of obesity, of a oh, huge change in our diets to this Western diet far removed from our traditional diets, as well as a history of severe starvation. And so what did a traditional diet really look at? Well, if we look at the Haudenosaunee, who resided in the northeast of the current United States, we see a diet with all these wonderful things of deer, of turkey, fish, maple syrup, berries, et cetera. Most importantly, it's lacking in carbohydrates and refined sugars. I have five minutes. I'm going to talk a little faster. <laughs> so, um, so if we look here, we basically did a estimation looking at percentile macronutrient content, since there's no specific recipes. Point is, is that while there is fat, it's high in healthy unsaturated fats, we do see carbohydrates, we also see a huge amount of protein. And when we were moved onto reservations, we had commodities, sugar, lard, fry bread, basically. And so what we see here is comparing a traditional to a commodity is that there's a huge difference, right? In that commodity, there's virtually no protein, there is huge carbohydrates, unhealthy saturated fats, and what's more, super low and important vitamins and minerals. So we're really looking at, while it's a lot of calories, almost no nutrients. And so that brings us to this baby that looks really healthy, really fat, you wanna cuddle it, but the point is, is that it could be starved. It could be overweight and it could be starved. And that's the case we see in fry bread. Um, and that's a, lot of, that's a starvation a lot of our ancestors were born into. And we see further evidence of this kind of nutrient starvation affecting us in certain medical studies, where if pregnant sheep were deprived of B vitamins, then that actually led to a lot of health implications in their offspring, including high fat levels and insulin resistance. And further examination actually did show alterations in their DNA, epigenetics. So what does this mean for us? Are we doomed? Doomed to bad health, doomed to obesity? No. We're very resilient, and that's what we can tell our children. That there are studies that have actually shown that with appropriate nutrient supplementation, that this can actually reverse those aspects. That 
that mouse models that have transgenerational obesity end up getting that removed with the appropriate nutrient supplementation. And cohort studies with B9 supplementation actually showed de decreased risk of obesity in their offspring. And that extends beyond pregnancy into infancy, where mothers, even if the baby's in a high-fat fetal environment, can actually have decreased risk of certain aspects of metabolic disorders if they're given a nutritious diet through the mother's breast milk. And this doesn't just end with the mother's nutrition, but extends on. It, all of us are an example for these children, not just our mothers, but the fathers, the entire community, because there are critical periods of obesity. And during those times, children are learning from us, from their community. And so really through us, our children can learn good exercise and good diet. And so I believe that good nutrition is really going to be a key factor and a good start down a good path towards improving our health holistically. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, next we have Jordan Harad of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. He is a doctoral student in health promotion at the University of Oklahoma. Please welcome Jordan. Uh, Halito, hello. Uh, I'm Jordan Harrod. I'm um, here representing the University of Oklahoma and also um, the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, my tribe. So if I mess anything up terribly, don't tell either OU or the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Um, so I'm gonna talk about one of the um, grants I work on, which is the Thrive Study. Thrive is uh, Tribal Health and Resilience in Vulnerable Environments. Okay, it was um, an NHLBI funded grant and it's a randomized trial and it, um, it approaches it through a CBPR orientation with two tribal nations. And I'm actually gonna stop myself right there and say, um, I wanna say thank you to the Chickasaw and Choctaw Nation. Um, I actually came into this project as it was just getting started. I worked for my current boss about a week before we had our first big team meeting with the two tribes. So they've been really good to let me just kind of go along for the ride and learn as I go, which I really, really appreciate because I certainly needed it in the beginning days. Um, so the point of our program was to implement healthy makeovers in tribally owned convenience stores. Um, in both of our tribal nations, uh, both nations own their own C stores or convenience stores. Um, we have Chickasaw Travel Stops or CTS and Choctaw Travel Plazas, which try very hard to get that correct in two neighboring tribes. It's very hard. Um, and also we were trying, our primary outcome was to increase vegetable and fruit intake among the tribal citizens. And we hypothesized that in a tribally owned convenience store, we would have more buy-in and it would just be much easier than buying from other places. So our aim one was to quantify the food and physical environment. Um, so we did this with a massive baseline survey. I became super um, immersed in a quantitative survey and the PowerPoint slides, sorry, I'm looking away. The PowerPoint slides say iPad, iPad kiosk located in community and clinic based settings. Um, that's a generalization. It was actually iPad kiosks managed by tribal members. So I also, again, want to thank them because all of the, um, the video we watched earlier said moccasins on the ground. All of those are tribal citizens. We, um, I currently live in Tulsa and our OU facility is two hours away from one tribe and an hour and a half from the other. So the tribal members of our team are really the eyes and ears and heart and soul and brain and almost everything to this project. I just get to stand and smile most of the time. Um, the perceived and objective measures we were looking for were um, sociodemographics. Uh, we also looked at health behaviors, outcomes, um, self-reported BMI, which we uh, got through height and weight measurements, things like that. Um, so what we found from our survey, there was in uh, 13, about 250 in each tribe. 29% uh, were overweight. Nearly half were told by a health professional that they had high blood pressure. Um, a quarter had diabetes, uh, and most reported fewer than three servings of vegetables a day. Um, and 56% reported fewer than two servings of fruit a day. So our second aim was to use particip participatory research methods to implement and evaluate a multi-level convenience store intervention. Um, and we did this in a number of ways, uh, focus groups, which I'm actually really excited to say I moderated all but one of the focus groups with help from um, our tribal partners. They acted as note takers and moderators. So again, big thanks to them for letting me kind of get my feet wet with that. 
and I actually saw Dr. Flashhacker earlier yesterday, and I bombarded her, and I was like, oh my god, I read your paper so many times, thank you so much. So, just so she knows, I'm super, a giant fan of hers. Um, we also use video voice and qualitative environmental footage. Um, we're lucky to have a native videographer. He's a Choctaw citizen. He's made several documentaries, and he is videotaping everything we do, which will eventually be turned into um, a documentary and hopefully a toolkit when we're finished with the grant. Um, and we also did the uh, Nutrition Environment Measure Survey, or the NIM survey, um, which was by Dr. Karen Glanz. Uh, if you haven't done it, it's a very extensive survey in C stores, and it was again completed. I feel like I'm really lazy standing up here now. Completed by our tribal our tribal teammates. They did all of the groundwork for us. So we did a total of 12 focus groups, um, eight to 10, sometimes 12 individuals. Um, one thing that I was really excited about was people were actually beating down the doors. They wanted to give their opinion, and food was something that they were really. I will go faster. Really. Um, really excited to talk about. And um, so they decided, or some of the themes that came up, um, they talked about price and how they would purchase healthier foods if they were as cheap as unhealthy foods. We all know that junk food is a lot cheaper typically than fruits and vegetables, especially in a convenience store. Um, also that they were sold in tribal stores where they knew where the revenue was going. So they knew that these stores supported their local economy and went back to the tribe. And that they were tribally sourced and or endorsed with tribal store logos. Um, one of the leaders of the tribe had just started an initiative, um, a weight loss, um, a health initiative, and so they specifically talked about any time that person's seal or signature or stamp of approval was on something, they would almost without question buy it because they had complete trust in him. So the specific aim or specific strategies, we tried to focus on the four Ps. So increased availability, which we did with um, quick packs, um, sandwiches and wraps that were made in-house and salads. Um, labeling, so foods were labeled um, with all new signage, which I will show you guys in a second. Um, placements, both tribes bought open air coolers or used an already open air cooler and bought um, in cap space, which are the shelves on the end of caps. Um, so those were specifically intervention shelves. And then promotion, which again, I will show you in just a second some of the signage we came up with. Um, so here is a before picture of just some close ups of what we saw. So these hot boxes, which have um, Corn dogs, chicken strips, burritos, things that I totally grew up on as a child because, you know, when you, you go in and you grab something really fast, and also um, rows and rows and rows and rows of soda and energy drinks. Um, here is the signage, and I hope you can see the pictures of some of the after pictures. So um, one of the promotional materials was everyday choice in one tribe. The other tribe, it was uh, better choice, fresher choice, and value choice. Um, and you can see the big better choice sign. That's one of the in caps with healthier foods. And then below the everyday choice is one of the um, island or walk-in coolers or reach-in coolers with healthy salads, um, healthy sandwiches, wraps, and other healthy snacks. So preliminary, out preliminary outcomes that we found um, in one of the tribes, they actually implemented foods a little bit faster. And so these outcomes were just from moving foods around. Um, kind of grouping them all, and I think it was before a lot of the um, signage even came up, all of the selected snack and meal items sold out midweek during all four weeks. Um, a lot of times when we did our evaluations, they wouldn't have food on the shelves, and we would ask managers or people working, you know, why is this not on our intervention shelf? And they'd say, oh, well, it's been sold out, and we don't get another truck for a day, which is a great um, problem to have. Um, store sales receipts. Also showed changes um, that among the items that were just moved into one healthier space, um, it, they saw an overall 71% increase in sales data pre and post intervention. And we are currently in the process of um, evaluating these every week, every now biweekly. We're about in our midway point, and we're actually getting some really good both quantitative and quant qualitative and quantitative data. And um, again, for the 30th time, because I can't state that enough, I would just like to thank the Chickasaw and Choctaw Nation for um, giving me a platform to kind of learn as I go and give back to my tribe and help them. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Next, we have Jason Champagne of the Red Lake Band of Chippewa. He was up here earlier talking. He's currently the community wellness chef for the Shakopee Metadewakanton Sioux community. And he is also pursuing his Master of Public Health degree in Public Health Nutrition at the U of M. Please welcome Jason. 
Bonjour, everybody. I'm so fortunate and uh, thankful to be able to uh, be up here today and, be, and really honored to be able to present my research. Uh, it's the first time I presented it, so I'm very, uh, very excited about this. And uh, I got quite a few slides, so I'll try to move fast as, as fast as I can through them. And uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Jamie Stang, Dr. Uh, Tiffany Beckman, and Dr. Craig Hassel for. Uh, being with me throughout my uh, journey, throughout my master's program, and uh, they've really done a lot for me, so I really appreciate that. And uh, It's really unique where I can be a chef full-time for the last three years, but then take a break and do some research at a wonderful conference like this, presenting my master's project, so I'm very fortunate. So the target population here, the uh, Amer Native Americans who live in uh, urban populations, a little bit of background, uh, there's been an increase of uh, nearly 1 million American Indians who relocated to urban areas between uh, 2000 and 2010. And uh, the target uh, my pop of the population was, uh, my survey was 18 years or older living in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And uh, I developed a uh, questionnaire, 30 questions, 28 were uh, qualitative or quantitative and two were qualitative and uh, topics covered demographics and uh, health concerns they face, awareness of programs, and uh, food procurement uh, preparation and security. So I developed a, a computer-based survey uh, through SurveyMonkey, and this was administered at the Red Lake Embassy in uh, Minneapolis uh, in a small office space. And uh, I assisted anybody that wasn't, there were some uh, elders that didn't really want to run the computer, so I kind of assisted them. And uh, going back, I kind of wish I would have had a paper copy so that they could have used a pen, pencil. Inclusion criteria, uh, American Indian had to be a f member of a federally recognized tribe, 18 years or older. And uh, here's some demographics. I had total of 65 respondents, uh, 68, three were excluded due to the tribal affiliation. 59% were uh, female and 41% uh, were male. The most dominant age group was between 40 and 49. And uh, so respondents 30 and older were more likely to have diabetes in the total sample. Uh, ranking of health issues that they seen, diabetes was number one, obesity two, cardiovascular disease was three, and hypertension was four. Uh, results of weight loss, so of the total sample, 72% had tried to lose weight in the past year, 91% uh, among those with diabetes, and then, um, so that uh, graph there, let me catch up here. So the blue is somewhat successful, so you can see that most of the participants that, uh, they, they reported that they were mostly, you know, successful losing weight, which is really good. And uh, here's another graph, uh, frequency of cooking meals at home. So, you know, another positive finding is that, uh, you know, majority of them are cooking at home five plus times a week, which is really uh, nice to see. Uh, negative about this is 15% uh, reported that they don't cook at home at all. So that's kind of tough. Uh, frequency of eating outside of the home. Uh, eating outside, uh, interestingly, survey respondents with diabetes reported eating out three or more times a week with, than those without diabetes. Let's see, did I pass one? And then 77% uh, of the respondents made attempts to cook at home of healthier foods. Under that in the blue writing is uh, those with and without diabetes. 63% uh, had questions about how to cook healthier foods. 70% of the survey uh, said that they reported reading labels or changing the way that they shop in order to purchase healthy foods. 80% of those with diabetes said the same thing. And 58% uh, reported difficulty in, a, in identifying appropriate portion size. So purchasing healthy foods and preparation, uh, the cost of purchasing healthy foods was a barrier for many. Um, as you can see, the uh, red is the total sample, the uh, yellow is a sample with diabetes, and then blue is a sample without diabetes. So often, you can see in the yellow with diabetes, they over 40%, 42 approximately, 
you know, has had trouble purchasing healthy foods at a due, at, due to cost. And then uh, how often in the past month have you felt like you did not have enough money to feed your family? It was a big issue. Uh, many people had, you know, really worried about that. Uh, the yellow there, uh, half the month with diabetes, almost half the respondents with diabetes reported that they uh, worried about not having enough money to feed themselves or their family. And in the past 12 months, have, how often did your family run out of food? And as you can see, uh, sometimes was almost 50% of uh, the whole population. So there's some uh, food security issues. And uh, results, uh, so 66% of the respondents were aware of programs that were offered for American Indians that addressed their four health concerns, which is a great thing. They're aware that there are programs. So what are the barriers to those them attending? Um, some of the qualitative uh, questions, you know, the respondents was uh, integrating mental, physical, and spiritual health. Uh, they want more of that into their uh, programs. And 62% uh, responded that they were very, very interested in cooking programs. And uh, there was no difference between diabetes and non-diabetes in that. 69% uh, were interested in participating in a program to help them shop for healthy foods on a budget. And 75% uh, were interested in group walking and physical activities. 81% of them with diabetes. So I, I see very positive findings with this right here. So uh, if, if I could develop or anybody could develop a program, what would you recommend? A uh, program should integrate physical, mental, and spiritual health. Uh, integration of services for health and, and food support and economic assistance, multi-generational programs that would be attractive to all ages, uh, more focus on teaching the young how to eat right at an early age, and uh, more assistance with daily monitoring of blood sugar levels and food, home visits and home delivered meals, incentive programs to encourage continued success, and uh, gardening and food preservation classes that stress indigenous food and uh, spiritual connection to the land. So one of the most important things to consider when we're uh, developing these new programs is the voice of the key informants of our community, and one of those is the uh, elders of our community. So 86% uh, of the respondents said that this is a key consideration. One specifically said, we want knowledgeable instructors on the subject that uh, our health concerns American people face. And uh, going back to that, uh, it's very, very important that another American Indian lead these programs. So this, there's a great interest from overall sample in, food, in nutrition programs, physical activity, cooking programs. Um, individuals are trying to lose weight. Some have been successful. Uh, again, food costs and security are, very, very, are barriers. And uh, what we need to do, again, is just uh, gain, in my opinion, gain knowledge from the, from the uh, native elders get their input into these programs that we develop. Uh, maybe all over we can get some um, focus groups together, gain a bunch of knowledge from these focus groups, from these elders. Make sure that these elders have a say into each one of these programs. Make sure that their voices are heard and uh, in these programs provide the nutrition education, the physical activity, and the assistance with basic cooking knowledge. And uh, it's going to take collaboration from diabetes programs, elderly programs, food shelf programs, individual tribal agencies, and urban within this urban setting. And uh, probably one of the biggest things that I, I see is uh, increase the number of health professionals. So, you know, in my opinion, if uh, if our kids knew, if our Native American kids knew how important it was that they go educate themselves in the areas of uh, health and nutrition and public health and dietetics uh, and in culinary arts, you know, would that give them motivation? Would that help them say, well, for the future of my people, I need to educate myself so I can start filling some of these, you know, programs that are not Native run? And uh, it's also, you know, is there a barrier from these uh, people attending these programs because these programs are not native run? So I really would like to see an initiative that we uh, bring together, you know, a focus on the kids and, and showing them maybe even some further data collected on a larger uh, sample size of how important it is that another American Indian educate these programs. 
And then in conclusion, you know, great things. They're, they're, they're interested in improving their overall health and wellness. Um, how important it is that American Indian Health Professional run a program. And uh, could our American Indian youth be the answer to the future of these uh, successful programming in urban native communities? Miigwech, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Jason. All right, now we have Brandon Onefeather, who is Oglala Lakota. He's an American Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology certified biochemist, who is working as a research assistant at the U of M. Please welcome Brandon. Okay. All right, um, what I wanted to do here was uh, talk about kind of uh, two aspects. I wanted to present some research, but also present some uh, personal experience, per se. Um, so the title of my talk today is uh, the high, How High Protein Diet uh, Lowers Glycated Hemoglobin Levels and Also Increases Target Cell Insulin Sensitivity in uh, Patients with Diabetes Type 2. Uh, I want to talk about, a little bit about myself. Um, I've been a healthcare, or I've been wanting to be a healthcare provider since I was really little. Uh, I started out in the United States Navy, um, become, or I became a uh, Navy hospital corpsman. Basically, it's, you know, you're, you're, you're battlefield medic. So I've got to get some interesting experience. And beyond that, I really wanted to understand science and be able to speak, under, speak science and understand science. Because when you see these big giant, um, you know, journal articles, you know, you know they, they could be in another language, per se. So, so I started, uh, started my journey, and uh, I went to the uh, South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, and then eventually um, University of Minnesota. Uh, currently, I work in uh, Dr. Tiffany Beckman's laboratory, she's right over here, and we're working with uh, diabetes type 2 uh, uh, research. Uh, before that, I worked in structural dynamics uh, with muscular dystrophy, and also doing uh, site-directed uh, mutagenesis, learning how to break things and put it back together in a molecular sense. Um, I did a, a really heavy um, curriculum in sciences so I could learn to speak uh, genetics and physiology and biochemistry. And one of the great classes that I've actually taken uh, was actually uh, the University of Minnesota has a very, um, a, a very great uh, person named uh, Dr. Dave Thomas. And he has uh, a muscle curriculum. And that's where I learned uh, the greatest amount of knowledge I have uh, in muscle, which actually pertains a lot to diabetes, okay? All right, food is medicine. So we heard a lot about diabetes type 2, and so what I want to do is uh, give a little overview of uh, diabetes type 2 and its pathology, uh, or its pathophysiology. Um, so, to sort of, so diabetes type 2 is kind of a culmination of several different factors. Um, that eventually contribute to the, to the end result of diabetes type 2. Um, one, one of the biggest uh, beginnest, beginning things that um, you know, contribute to diabetes type 2 is obesity, uh, you know, the, the poor diet, and the lack of exercise. Uh, additionally, on the other side of things, we have uh, genetic risk factors. That will be like a positive history of uh, diabetes type 2. And both of these kind of, um, kind of snowball into, into something else. Um, but to start with, we have uh, insulin resistance. Uh, we're always kind of at a flux with, with the, um, the hormones in our body. And so the, the, the hormone regulations uh, kind of help us keep our blood sugar in check. And one of the, uh, one of the notable ones we all hear about is insulin. Uh, insulin basically needs to get inside the cell to create usable energy. And when you can't do that, and uh, it, you know, the system is being retarded in some way, that's when we develop insulin resistance, okay? Uh, your body basically um, it isn't able to do that. And so your body compensates for that, and it upregulates uh, the production of insulin. So your pancreas is going, you know, going harder and harder and harder, and that's when we develop something called hyperinsulinemia. Okay, so, uh, so through time, People can get away with you know, having hyperinsulinemia and, and have normal glucose, uh, no, normal glucose tolerance. Okay? But over time, this begins to break down. And we start getting, getting a glucose, our impaired glucose tolerance. And the impaired glucose tolerance is, is kind of one of the first signs. Uh, let's see, let's go the other direction. Uh, 
uh, you know, one of the first indicators of diabetes uh, type 2. And uh, diabetes type 2 has uh, three traits that really kind of characterize the disease. Uh, and that's increased glucose, uh, hepatic glucose production. And increased hepatic glucose production uh, is basically your liver trying to increase the glucose amount to, to feel, feel uh, your muscles and your cells in your body. And your body is telling, you know, telling your system, you, you know, you're starving me. Okay? Uh, after that, we have a peripheral insulin, resi peripheral insulin resistance, and that's uh, our skeletal muscles. Um, we need to get... We need to get uh, insulin into our skeletal muscles because we use them on a daily basis all the time in you know, everything that we do. And so um, when that starts breaking down, uh, your muscle tissue also starts to break down as well because it takes those, you know, it takes usable uh, amino acids to actually uh, try to fill those cells. And those cells over time will you know, start to break down because we're not getting that usable energy in there. And uh, the, the last one is uh, decreased beta cell function. Like I said, with the hyperinsulinemia, um, your uh, pancreas is just going and going and going and going, and finally it begins to tire out. And in a decrease in beta cell function is observed, and so you're not producing a mu as much insulin. And these are kind of the, uh, the, the three uh, the traits, I guess, that uh, um, are saw in diabetes type 2 patients. And so beyond that, we have some scary words that we always hear in, uh, in Indian country, such as cardiovascular disease, uh, cerebrovascular disease, liver disease, and cancer. Um, and, you know, those are some scary words. We hear them all the time. And, you know, we hear the data, and we see the data, and all these are all on there. You know, all the health disparities of Native Americans. And so it, it kind of culminates from the diabetes type 2. Okay. <clears throat> so what next? Um, so implement, implementation of a, um, a strategy with your healthcare provider, uh, either a, a minimum uh, weight gain or, minimum, or a weight loss program is usually one of the, you know, the, the best key factors in addition to a standard of care, including uh, metformin, you know, spinorias, different medications like that. And also your uh, healthcare provider might you know, introduce uh, some management of your comorbidities as well. As well. All right, so... <clears throat> Me as a, uh, a student, basically, at the University of Minnesota, uh, you know, I got to learn, uh, learn a lot uh, being in Dr. Beckman's laboratory. Uh, one, of the first, one of the first days that I was there, she gave me a book this big called Endocrinology, and she said, learn this. And I said, okay. And it took me a long time, but I did it. Uh, and I got to learn a lot about how the body is, you know, gets broken, about about how the body, um, you know, just the different pathologies of the body. And I didn't get to see a lot of the good things that came out of the research other than, you know, what I just, just had talked about. But every, everywhere, I, everywhere I looked, I've seen uh, the effects of a high-protein diet on type 2 diabetes and, uh, you know, how it lowers uh, hemoglobin A1C. And so I just, you know, I kept looking, for pa looking at papers and they just kept showing up, the effects of high-protein diet. Uh, hemoglobin A1C, blood pressure, uh, and metabolic responses, you know, to the high-protein high diet. Uh, one of them really caught my eye, and it was by uh, Dr. Gannon. Uh, and she's at the, uh, at the University of Minnesota and also at uh, the VA as well. And uh, what I come to understand from these papers is um, basically a high-protein diet in low in carbohydrates has shown to improve plasma glucose levels and ultimately lowering hemoglobin A1C. And also, a, you know, the, the high-protein diet also demonstrated to increase uh, insulin growth factor, which is an anabolic hormone uh, known to increase target cell insulin sensitivity. And since we're made of muscle, you know, if we increase our muscle mass, you know, we have a lot more fat burners in our, uh, I guess, in our, in our suitcase, I guess, so to speak. So I kind of took all, took all these to heart, you know, and um, started to understand, you know, what, um, you know, I have a molecular background, and so I really wanted to understand, uh, you know, what else is going on. And so um, here's, uh, here's Dr. Gannon's paper, which is an isocaloric diet, which means you're not really, you know, you're not losing weight. Uh, they wanted to uh, select for that, and so they wanted to take that out as a variable. And uh, here's, a, here's the control diet, which is 15% uh, 
uh, protein and also the, con or the, uh, the research diet, which is 30%, okay? <clears throat> and in that five-week study, they uh, saw a 1.25% glycated hemoglobin reduction. Uh, as you can see, the area under the curve uh, in the serum glucose response was a lot lower than, than the, uh, the actual target or the controlled diet, okay? And if you, uh, you know, if you kind of track, you know, patients with diabetes type 2 and things like that, the pharmace their pharmaceutical uh, agents don't, still can't account for that reduction, especially in the five-week study. Okay. All right, personal, my personal journey. So I wanted to kind of um, basically bring this home to myself, in my own personal journey. Uh, I was a student at the University of Minnesota, and so, you know, we had the, the, the sedentary lifestyle, you know, always studying, always trying to be, you know, be busy, I guess. And now I wasn't, you know, I wasn't historically a small person, a small frame person. I was always a big, you know, a, a big build big build kind of person, and in this, in this photo, I think I was uh, 245, uh, and then in this, in this uh, photo, I was around 250, okay? Uh, I came back from the Middle East in, uh, in April of 2015, um, feeling really terrible. I, you know, I was urinating a lot, you know, had a, I was always thirsty, and I just, you know, was feeling terrible, and I really couldn't understand what was going on with me until... Well, I guess I understood what was going on with me. I, I, I really did. I just didn't want to tell myself that, yes, that could possibly be diabetes. So I went to my health care provider, and my health care provider did a rapid hemoglobin A1C test, and it literally crushed me. Um, the rapid hemoglobin A1C was actually 17, and they re redid a, a, a glucose um, and came up with these numbers. Uh, at the time, I was... I was a, showed to be 11. I couldn't find the rapid test because they, they didn't get the paper of it, but I did find an old one, uh, and that showed it to be 11 out of, you know, from 6.1%. Uh, so that was terrible. Oh, my God, you know, diabetes. But that wasn't it. Look at my, my abnormal triglycerides, 5,000. And normally it's around 150. My, trigl or my uh, cholesterol was also almost two and a half times what, what normal would be, Okay. So I, being a molecular person, you know, wanted to understand. I learned to speak genetics. I learned to speak physiology, biochemistry, and endocrinology. And I wanted to, to uh, you know, understand what else was going on with me. Uh, because academically, I was doing great work. I was, you know, on, on top of everything, on top of my classes. But on a personal level, you know, there was, I felt like a little out of control. And I felt like there was nobody home. There was, you know, lights are on, nobody's home, nobody's driving the car. And that, un, you know, that feeling of uncon, uncontrol really scared me. And so I took these molecular papers and these, these uh, research papers, and specifically the, uh, the high-protein diet, uh, and I internalized it. And I, um, I, um, I, started, I started my diet. I uh, did a very high protein diet, um, much more than you know what, what's published. But the point is, is my healthcare providers they loved it. They said, "Whatever you're doing, keep doing it because everything is coming down, everything is going away. You're now off medications, and this is my third quarter now that I'm off medications, and I lost 80 pounds in the process." Yeah, so as you can see, my triglycerides mainly, they were, they were you know, really, really afraid for me there. They're actually back to normal. Uh, my hemoglobin A1C has actually not even changed. You know, it's gone down a lot, but it, it you know, hasn't really changed much. And I attribute a lot of that to basically understanding. You know, um, my healthcare provider gave me a bag of medicine and said, here, you know, now... Now, go into the world. And I said, and as, you know, somebody who wanted, who wanted to understand, I couldn't just do that. I had to be proactive and, and find out what, what made me happy again. Okay. And so, <clears throat> my continued success. Uh, basically, I, wa I watch what I eat. I, every single thing is accounted for um, on a daily basis. And that helps me maintain, my, you know, my weight balance. And I check my glucose levels. And everything has been fine for 
six months now, a little over six months. And I also have to remind myself to live life to the fullest. Thank you.